Hey guys, welcome to your first lecture in AP Environmental Science. Uh, this is chapter one. Um, your book should look like this. Uh, you should be getting your book uh, your first week of school. You don't necessarily need it right away, but you'll be fine as soon as you get it. So let's begin. This is the introduction to environmental science. Here are the objectives. You're going to notice throughout the year that I generally don't read lecture notes to you guys. I'll probably be uh, going over the important details and letting you know um, what's, what's to come, basically. The most important thing you probably have here is we're going to go through a lot of general terminology in the beginning, and then we're going to talk about what's called your ecological footprint. You'll be having an opportunity in our class uh, during your first week to calculate your personal ecological footprint. We're also going to delve into scientific method, graphing, and experimental design, which is a really big part of uh, this first chapter. So let's begin. The environment, There's, these are a lot of terms we're going to begin with. Um, you've heard a lot of these words before. I think the most difficult part of the environment, the definition, is that you have living and non-living. AP likes to use big words. On the AP test, they generally will talk about biotic and abiotic factors throughout. So on your exam, don't expect them to ask you about living and non-living. They're going to ask you about biotic and abiotic factors. Environmental science studies those factors and how everything inter interrelates with each other. Natural resources, this is a big deal in environmental science because we need natural resources to live. We need them for the things that we like in our lives, like technology, for example, the houses we live in, um, the food. We need a lot of different things. So this is two major ones, renewable versus non-renewable. Non-renewable, they run out, basically. Renewable, that means they can replenish themselves over time. Um, examples of renewable, we live in San Diego, I push this one a lot in our class, I'll be telling people solar, 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 if you can get solar panels on your house, that's the way to do it, because we have such, uh, we have so much sun throughout the year, um, it's basically inexhaustible. Um, other ones, for example, the exhaustible kind, water, for example, if we overuse it and we pollute it, it becomes exhaustible. Trees, if we don't let them we don't let them grow back, they're exhaustible. But if you allow them to replenish themselves over time, then things are okay. There's a balance, basically. Non-renewable sources. These are what we call the fossil fuels. Crude oil, natural gas, coal, and, min and minerals, for example. Those are not a fossil fuel, but minerals, we need them for all the techn technological advances and the battery technology that we're doing today. Ecosystem services. These come up a lot throughout the year. Um, they come up in several chapters in your book. These are things that we get for free because of the environment, because of the ecosystems around us, the living and the non-living around us. For example, purification of water happens with the land and the terrain as water percolates through the rocks. The plants and the trees take in air pollutants and help purify them out for us. Nutrients get cycled, um, name it flood prevention, Pollination, we need the pollinators for our fruits and vegetables. Um, when you have a hillside, you generally plant something on it so that it reduces erosion. So ecosystem services are things that we get from the living and the non-living things around us. A little bit of history. Well, population growth isn't so good for the environment because you need more resources. So we're just talking about exhaustible versus inexhaustible resources, renewable and non-renewable resources. When the agricultural revolution happened, this happened about 10,000 years ago, people finally started growing food. They went from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to people who were able to stay in one area. They were more sedentary. They didn't have to move around a lot, and they were allowed to, you know, they grow their food. And then you, from that, in turn, cities and things started to evolve, basically. Population started to grow. All right. Industrial revolution happened about um, mid 1700s into the 1800s. In this time frame, we started figuring out that we can burn stuff for energy like fossil fuels, like coal or oil, and we can burn those things, fossil fuels, and we can use that energy to mass produce things. Factories came into play. Huge urban cities came into play. So now make sure you understand the difference. These are terms that come up on the AP test. Rural versus urban city versus countryside basically um, what happened during this time frame technology advanced medicine got better we got better at producing food farming improved as a result of having machines that allowed you to do it basically people started consuming more goods um, cities started to grow so this was huge what happened in the population this time 
it's hard to see my graphs cut off because of the picture of me. Let me move it. Um, you can see there's a an exponential rise in population at that point. The population grew very quickly as a result of the Industrial Revolution. All right. Now, your footprint. Your footprint is very important. You're going to do a computer lab um, in your first week of school where you are going to add a bunch of parameters. And those parameters about your personal lifestyle are going to allow you to calculate what's called your footprint. So this is basically your impact on the Earth. Now, it's measured in space, all right? So like meter squared or miles squared, so on and so forth. The term you're going to use, you're going to see is hectares. A hectare is 10,000 square meters, basically. So your ecological footprint takes into account the things that you do in your daily life. For example, the kinds of foods you eat, how much you travel, whether you drive a car, how big your house is, so on and so forth. It's going to make you aware of the things that you do. They create a bigger footprint. All right. In the U.S., in the U.S., an average American, okay, if everybody on earth lived America's lifestyle, United States, our lifestyles, everybody on earth lived our lifestyle, we would need four earths, four earths to meet our needs. We would deplete the earth that quickly, all right? So why is the earth able to continue to, to you know, why are we able to have more people, populations growing when we need that much more space to have our lifestyle? Well, there are other countries where those people live a very low socioeconomic lifestyle. They have very little resources. So our excessive use of resources is balanced out in some cases by other people's lack of use of resources. It's not fair, basically. So you're going to be, uh, you're going to find out what you're, one of the things you're going to calculate is how much space you need. Okay. And another thing that you're going to calculate when you do your ecological footprint is how many earths that we would need if everybody had your lifestyle. I've seen the numbers in class range from two to like eight or nine Earths, all right? So you're gonna see a lot of things. If you, if you live in a huge house, you gotta think of it. Does everybody live in a huge house? No. So if everybody on the planet had a huge house, we would need many more Earths basically to, to survive, all right? It's a very cool concept because it allows you to kind of come up with ideas of your, your impact. Overshoot. This is a, an important concept. Overshoot is the day, basically, you're going to, the, the overshoot's going to come up in your calculation. The overshoot is at what point during the year are we using more resources than that year could have supplied? What's currently happening in the world is the overshoot day each year is happening sooner and sooner and sooner in the year. What it means is we are consuming the resources equivalent for a year. We are, we are consuming those resources faster at a faster rate every year so what we're doing is we're overusing resources in a, in a sense basically so we're getting to that point very quick back in the 60s people's footprint was the average footprint was about one so we were we we're in balance we weren't this is sustainability present day we're overshooting by quite a bit so we need to we need one earth as our ecological footprint that means and that's because all we have is one Earth. That's the ideal ecological footprint. But people were averaging above that. And in the U.S., the average is about four. So this is worldwide. You're talking just under two. Science, you've heard this many times. It's a process. It's a thinking process. Okay? I'm not going to go over it. I'm not going to hammer it out. But you all know it's a thinking process. you got to come up with ideas. they got to be testable. And then you come up with more ideas as a result of that. So here's the method. You observe, all right? Observe. Observations lead to questions, all right? So for example, your book uses an observation of, a, you, you notice a pond or a body of water, and you notice that it's green. Your observations are that it's green. Then you ask the question, what causes this green stuff, this algae to grow so heavily on the pond? So you observe a green pond. Your question is, is what's causing it to grow? What's, what's happening here? So your hypothesis has to answer that question. So your question is, what's causing this green stuff to, to grow so heavily in the nearby pond? This hypothesis will answer that question. So you've got to come up with an answer to that cause. An example of this answer would be agricultural fertilizers are running in the pond, causing the algae in the pond to increase. So maybe they notice that 
there's a farm nearby this pond. And do farms use a lot of fertilizer? Yeah. So your hypothesis says, I believe fertilizers are getting into the pond and they are causing basically the algae, the green stuff to increase. All right. Then you predict. All right. So fertilizers are added. I believe algae will increase. Okay. Algae will increase. Now you got to figure out a way to test this hypothesis. Okay. And that's the experiment part. Now the experiment part, this is important. AP asks a lot of questions about experiments and experimental design. They made a big deal of it on the last AP test this last year and there was only 22 questions on the entire test and it was all written format. And out of 22, I believe two questions of the 22 were related to experimental design. This is a very big deal to the AP College Board, especially for AP Environmental Science. Things you need to know. Anything that can affect your experiment is a variable. Control variables, things that you do not change between experimental groups. We're gonna talk about that in a second. When we go over an example, or it'll make more sense when I use the example. Independent variable, you might have called this when you were younger the experimental variable. This is what's being tested. If you're graphing, where does it go? On the x-axis, all right? So in the experiment we're talking about, fertilizers are making algae grow in the pond fertilizer would be what we're testing and that would be our independent variable the dependent variable okay this these definitions are kind of odd you're going to read it and you're going to be like the variable that is directly affected okay but it's kind of it basically the dependent variable is what you're measuring as a result of fertilizer input so once you know the independent variable you know it's fertilizer what are we going to be measuring we're going to be measuring the amount of algae so we're going to be measuring okay so a controlled experiment has two groups all right, has two groups. Have to have two or more groups. One of the groups will be your control group. The other group is generally called your experimental group. All right. Here's an example. First off, design experiment that tests the effects of dishwashing detergent on seed germination and plant growth. Um, the weird thing is my mom did this experiment when I was a kid indirectly on grass. All right. So she didn't do it on seed germination, but she did it on the grass in our yard. My mom used to believe that detergent helped the grass grow greener. So, and my mom wasn't so off, actually. I'll tell you about it in a little bit. So you start with two sets of groups, experimental group, control group. 20 radish seeds, 20 radish seeds. 20 pots, 20 pots. 200 milliliters of water, 200 milliliters of water. Eight hours of sun exposure, eight hours of sun exposure. Temperature stays the same. All these things that are kept the same are called the control variables. That's what they are. So what are the control variables? Everything that's kept the same, okay? What is the independent variable? This is the one thing that we are testing. The independent variable is not found in the control group, but it is found in the experimental group. It's the dishwashing detergent. So this is our independent variable. So in this case, what is the dependent variable? So what are you measuring in this? What are we measuring in this particular activity? Well, we're measuring what? Plant growth. So you can say uh, your dependent variable would be the height of your plants or the number of seeds that germinated. Basically, whatever it is you're measuring as a result of this experiment is your dependent variable. All right. You develop data. All right. And your data is the, is the, is the information you've taken in as a result of your experiment. Not all data meets your needs. It gets rejected all the time. Um, my wife works in the pharmaceutical industry and they will develop medicines and they, the medicine won't work for the, the, for the ailment they're trying to cure. And then they realize it has an indirect effect and it helps people with another possible ailment. So then their company will change how they are doing the FDA testing and they'll move into another direction and actually in the end end up maybe with one or two drugs that help multiple things as a result of rejecting one possible hypothesis. Graphing, we'll do it really quick. Title, this is everything you need for a correct graph. Title, labels, with units, scaling, meaning your interval has to stay the same. And this will make more sense when I give you an example. Best fit lines or curves for line graphs. The dependent variable is on the Y and the independent is on the X. So let's look here. What's wrong with this graph? Do we have a title? No. 14, 15, 19, 20, 22, 24. This interval is off. So the scaling is off. Temperature. Do we have the units of temperature? No. 
Look over here, 57, 61, that's four. 61 to 64, that's three units. So the scaling is off. When you do a graph like this, you'll probably notice these numbers, 14, 15, 19, they just transpose them on the bottom here. These numbers here, 57, 61, those are right here. When you make a graph this way where you take the numbers and put them right in your graph, you will make a straight line. Okay, That's what you're going to make every time, and that's not a scientific graph. Now let's look at this one. Title, labels, units. The scaling here is by one. The scaling here is by two. Do you have to start at zero? No. You produce dots. These are points. Then you make what's called a best fit line. It's an average of our data points. And that allows us to analyze the data and estimate. At 17 degrees, right about here, how many protozoans do we estimate? You would come up to the graph there. You would come up over here. Whoops. You'd come up over here, and you would expect about 64. At 25 degrees, there, you come up to there, all the way over there, and you're talking about 75 or 76, about 75 or so. Okay? So this is how you would do estimates using a best fit line, or it could be a best fit curve. All right? What we do in science is we have scientists review each other. That's what's, ha what's happening right now. You're hearing about COVID-19 this and COVID-19 that. A lot of it hasn't been peer-reviewed, so it's not the best information. Until it's been peer-reviewed, it's not so, it's not really, it wouldn't necessarily be relevant. A theory, a theory is when we've continued test hypotheses and we keep supporting it over and over again, all over the world by many scientists, eventually it becomes a theory, all right? And sustainability, if you were at San Diego State, you wouldn't take an environmental science major. Your major would be called sustainability. Basically, how do we live in a way where things are long-term and we will not overuse our resources so that other generations will be able to utilize those same resources? And finally, what's happening? The earth is getting crowded. 360,000 people are born each day. 151,000 die. That means about 200,000 people a day. That means every five days, a million people are are added to the planet. The wealthier nations, they use a lot of resources, a lot. In the United States, about 10% of the U.S. owns 70% of the country. So these, these gaps in wealth and all this technology and all these things, you'd be surprised how it affects our footprint. Um, basically, developed nations, United States, way bigger footprints than developing nations.